This is going to be a video about the Thompson Center Scout, the historical looking firearm that never was. Hi, this is Scott from Whiskey and Sunshine Off Grid. And if you've been watching our channel for very long, you know that we really usually don't talk too much about guns here. It's not that we don't have them or use them. They're a big part of our life, actually. But back a few years ago, I did do a video about black powder firearms. We had three different black powder guns here and I uh, shot them all and showed you how to clean them and did all that stuff. It's like a three-part video. Well, just the other day, somebody commented on one of those videos and wanted to know more about my old Thompson Center Scout. And I thought, you know, son of a gun, I know what he means because when I bought mine, I wanted to look up some information on it and I couldn't find much information on it. Not at all, actually. I mean, the reason that I knew about them was because they had made just across the state line in Rochester, New Hampshire. That's where Thompson Center Factory used to be. So before we get into too much about the Scout itself, I've got to talk to you a little bit about the differences in muzzle loaders and a history of kind of the Thompson Center company because it's very relevant to the Thompson Center Scout, why you don't see very many of them around, or maybe you've never seen one, and why they're different. Maybe even controversial, some might say. Thompson Center, as a company, uh, got their start, I want to say it was in the late 60s, early 70s. Uh, they started producing, I want to call them knockoffs. We'll talk them very authentic, we'll call them very authentic reproductions of the old muzzle loaders like the Hawk and the Kentucky Rifle, the New England, uh, the New England, uh, well, I guess it was actually the New Englander was, the, was what it was called. They made several different copies of historic firearms and they really took off. And really at the time, I think you could almost say that Thompson Center and I guess Connecticut Valley Arms or CVA back then were probably the driving force in the repopularization of uh, black powder and black powder firearms. Because before that, uh, I think there was only probably Dixie Gunworks and a few other companies that had them. And it was very, a lot of stuff was very kind of eclectic and a lot of parts and stuff were hard to get because they were the real old antique firearms. And they've done a great job of keeping those old going, all those old guns going. Thompson Center comes along, along with Connecticut Valley Arms or CVA, and they say, hey, let's, uh, let's make some new ones of those. So that's how both of those companies got started and that's how they really got their momentum to move forward. Companies evolve and they head in different directions all the time. Of course, the financial situation of the economy at any given time and, you know, let's face it, uh, guns aren't popular anyway. So gun companies in the past 30 or 40 years, a lot of them have moved and come and gone. And unfortunately, Thompson Center has been a victim of all that. That wasn't where their problems first started, though. They, <laughs> they've been a controversial company for a while. They get into trouble with the ATF over their old Thompson Contender pistol that they used to have, because you could change barrels by just pulling a lever and you could pull that lever off your Thompson Contender and you could switch from 22 long rifle to 30-30 or 308 or a regular hunting rifle caliber and a long single shot pistol like the pictures that we're seeing now. <laughs> And they were a great gun, but the problem is the ATF decided that you had to have a certain length barrel in order for it to be a smooth bore. So they had to take uh, precautions and make sure that their shorter smooth bore shotguns had to have enough rifle in them, rifling in them to be used for another caliber. And that's where the Thompson Center 45 Long Colt 410 shotgun combo came in because it would shoot 410 shotgun shells wonderfully, and you could also drop 45 long Colt, and it was actually chained before and rifled, and you could use it. So it was actually a very practical gun. It did two different things. As time went on, uh, they started making other models, newer models of inline muzzle loaders. As that trend moved along, everybody wanted to get away from the old percussion cap type firearms from the side locks and go to inlines so that the, the charge was directed straight into the powder instead of being 
around through an elbow like a side lock or a hawk and a Kentucky rifle would have. So that was kind of the beginning of the modernization period. That's what I'm going to call it. Uh, when they started going to inlines, the first inlines just used regular percussion caps, just like the old Hawken and the old Kentucky rifle did. Most of them had a spring-loaded bolt that you pulled back, you put the percussion cap in, and when you pulled the trigger, the bolt would slam ahead and, and fire the firearm. Well, the folks at Thompson wanted to come up with a better way. So enter one of my favorite muzzle loaders of all time, the Thompson Setter Scout. Uh, this old girl takes the percussion cap just like the Hawkins do. It goes right on that nipple, just sits there. But it fires that percussion cap absolutely straight into the black powder. So there's no hinky nipple that runs around the corner into the, you know, you, you have very, is a lot better chance of this gun going off, especially in foul weather, than you do of one of the old ones. So even though the gun still looks like something that Buffalo Bill or, uh, you know, Bat Masterson should have been toting around slaughtering Buffalo on the plains, it never happened. This gun was actually first released to the public and went into mass production around about 1990, <laughs> believe it or not. So, I mean, this isn't a copy of anything. It just looks like it should be. It just looks cool. And I was hooked very early. I uh, happened to go to a local sand pit to sight my rifle in about this time of the year, many years ago. And somebody that I knew was there and was sighting in one of these scouts. And I thought, now there's a muzzle loader that I could carry and feel good about. It just looks cool. I think at the time, the fellow that owned that original scout was right in his assumption that, well, you're just like it because it looks like an old lever action 3030 and it's thin and it carries good. And well, you know what? I think he was right. <laughs> Cause I am a sucker for that stuff, but I never bought one. I, I haven't, I hadn't found one. You know, they, they, they were gone almost as soon as they showed up because in 1996, Thompson Center Arms in Rochester, New Hampshire, suffered a huge, huge loss when their factory burned down. At least the major part of their factory burned down. Now that was where they made a lot of their historic firearm reproductions and that's also where they made their scout rifles and their scout pistols. When they wanted to rebuild, they kind of turned away from all that and they turned towards more modern black powder firearms like this one, which is a Thompson Center Omega. My first black powder gun wasn't a lot different than that, except that this one is more like a Creedmoor and then it has a falling block. So you can drop the action and just put a 209 primer in there, close it, and you're ready to go if you've got your, your, uh, your barrel all charged with powder and a, and a projectile. These also, because they use a 209 primer, they lend themselves very well to pelletized powders, propellants. So hopefully that explanation of, about where the scout lies in the... Uh, genealogy of black powder firearms because it is kind of confusing it's, it's got a lot of things that are very similar to a brand new inline but also it shares a lot of stuff with the old Hawken but now that you see the difference between the modern and the more traditional we have to look at some of the products that go with them and how it pertains to the Scout Okay, so there are a few different types and a few different choices to make when you're looking at your black powder to start with, and I'm talking about the powder itself. This stuff from Germany, this is actually real black powder. This stuff is very fine. It is a powder. Works very good. A lot of smoke. They've been using it for centuries. I mean, the Chinese invented this stuff. It's good stuff. Hard to clean, messy, uh, very uh, corrosive. Likes to make your guns rust, things like that. I still keep some around because it's cheap, it's handy to have. From there we move on to what are called black powder substitutes. These are three good options right here. 
I myself, well, I use all of these. These are all mine, but these are full. Uh, lately, what I've been using is 777 from Hodgdon. Works really well. One of the reasons I like it, the same for its cousin Pyrodex, which is also a Hodgdon company, is that it also comes in these pellets. It's pelletized, like these right here. That is a 50 grain pellet. So you can literally take two of those pellets and a projectile, drop them in that barrel in the right order, put a primer on there and you're ready to go without measuring anything, which is pretty handy if you're reloading in the woods. I'll give you that. So these inlines, they are easier if you use the modern product because it's not much harder to load one to reload it than it is to reload a regular single shot center fire rifle where you just drop the round in and close the bolt. They're very fast. They're very fast to reload. You can use all these different powders in this Hawker, this I'm gonna say Hawken because it's of all the wood, it's got me thinking about a Hawken now, but in this Scout, because it is a Magnum and I've shot 100 grains of powder through it several times. I believe it's rated for 150. I don't even put 150 grains of powder in my modern in line. 100's fine. So there's just no sense going any bigger. The reason I don't use the powdered, uh, the uh, powdered pellets in these, this type of a gun is because even though it's an inline, instead of using one of these 209 primers, like a modern Masaloda has, which actually came from a shotgun, that was a shotgun primer originally, this takes the old number 11 percussion cap, just like the old days. So they're kind of weak. When you compare one to the other, you can see that one's gonna make a lot bigger bang than the other one. Also, when the percussion caps go off, they shatter and pieces of them go everywhere. Whereas the shotgun primers or the 209s, everything stays in the gun. It's, it's just like firing a 22. Uh, everything stays together. You have to pull out the remains of the uh, of the cap just like you would if it was a spent 22 casing. Now the reason that they made these pellets the way that they did with the hole in the middle, well actually there's a couple reasons. It's, it makes them a lot easier to pull them out of the box with this pipe cleaner so you don't have to get your fingers all over them which gets them damp which is not good for black powder. You want to keep this stuff dry. Also they left this hole in the middle. I don't know if it might be an aid to manufacturing but it was supposed to allow the fire from your 209 primer to shoot straight down and ignite it all at once to give you more velocity instead of just igniting the very back and letting it burn towards the front. With a 209 primer, this will make one more fast explosion. You'll gain velocity, range, all that stuff. Uh, that, I guess that was the theory, but it makes for a really good way to hold them at every one of these boxes always comes with a pipe cleaner in it. Now, for a long time, I couldn't figure out why, and I was just like slobbering all over my powder pellets, and some old timer corrected me and said, you know, you're losing a lot of power by getting your fingers all over your, your black powder, son. <laughs> True that. <laughs> so I tend to use these in the inlines more, the modern inlines with the 209 primers. That's why I have two different types of the exact same powder. This is pelletized, this is not. This is actual black powder. Well, actually it's black powder substitute. And if you can see, it's not very powdery. It's actually very granule. Lots of grains in there. Those grains are actually a specific size. They go through a, a screen and it makes them that size. And the reason being, it's because you have to use a powder measure to measure your powder. This powder measure here, if you're gonna get one of these older uh, muzzle loaders like this, or a Hawken, or a Kentucky, or a Renegade, or a, you know, there's, there's lots of them. Uh, I'd advise you that this is the best powder measure I think ever made. It was also made by Thompson Setter, but there's still a lot of them out there, and I, Thompson's still selling them. It's one of the few things they're still selling at this point, they've been bought out by Smith & Wesson, and they got caught up in that whole liquidation deal. So Thompson Center, for the most part, as far as a firearm company, 
is gone. What they have is what they have. They're not manufacturing anymore. They're not, they're not choosing to, to continue on. So unless somebody buys them out, even now that they've rebuilt the, comp uh, the company in Massachusetts under the uh, flag of, of Smith & Wesson, I don't know. I guess Smith's not interested. And what? Screw them. They're good guns. Uh, they're all good guns from, from uh, Thompson Center Arms. All of them. I'm not going to poo-poo on any of them. All this stuff is good. This powder measure works. It's 50 grains closed all the way, and every click you pull it out adds another 10 grains. So when you go five clicks, that gives you your 100 grains of powder. Or if you want to use 80 or 90, you just back it off a couple clicks, and that gives you the right measurement. Pretty simple. You know, and it's, it's really small. You're not going to break it. It's made out of brass. So what I do is I, I, uh, I carry a powder flask, and I use loose powder in this gun because it's only using a percussion cap. Ah, remember? Less power. That way, there's something right in front of that nipple instead of a hole it to ignite the powder. So it's going to go right into the powder and burn like it's supposed to. I'm not, I'm really not concerned with shooting a thousand yards with this. I know I'm never going to get the performance out of it that I'm going to get with a modern inline anyway. I don't expect that. And I'm not shooting competition. I do this for the fun of it and to hunt. Uh, what do you say we take this thing apart? So I know what you're thinking. He cheated. Yeah, I did. I kind of cheated. This was the first time I've ever taken this apart this far. And you know, with it being an old gun and being a black powder gun, I bought this used, bear in mind, it had been sitting around for a long time, so I didn't know how hard it was gonna come apart. So yes, I cheated, I tore it all apart off camera. It came apart pretty easy. Uh, I'll have you guys watch me put it back together and we can explain what all the parts are. It's actually very simple. As you can see, there are several parts to it. In my opinion, it does have to come apart this far for a good cleaning. And if you're gonna actually use the thing, I'd say you should do this at least once a year. But it's really not that big of a deal. Is it harder than today's um, non-traditional in lines with the polymer stocks and uh, 209 primers? Yeah, it definitely is. But uh, even though those are nice and I love them, they don't get the cool factor points that this thing gets. So let's put this old girl back together. So this part is the nipple and uh, it doesn't look like a nipple like you'd find on a 209 gun or like on an old uh, side lock like a hawk and because it actually threads right into the back of the barrel like the inline that it is. People say they're not. They, I guess the point of contention is that it takes a percussion cap instead of taking a 209 primer and it fires down into this chamber and there are two ports for the fire to come out. Well, I guess because there isn't a hole, well, there is actually a hole on the very end. So it's an inline, no matter what. I don't know, I guess Knight needs to take the credit for all the inline stuff, but in my mind, these were the first ones. Now being black powder, this isn't a centerfire rifle, so we use a lot of different chemicals on it. And I'm gonna use some Never Seize on these threads, which in my opinion is better than anything else you can put on it. And again, it's a black powder gun, it's different, so. We're just gonna make sure it's gonna come apart next time. They came apart good for me, so if I get some never sees on it, maybe it'll come apart again next year. Doesn't take a lot. You don't need to be running around looking like the Tin Man or anything, because this stuff's terrible. You get it all over you. I like the paste instead of the can with the brush. It's just like a, a, a tube of chapstick, a stick of chapstick. You, turn it and the never sees comes out and it's solid so it doesn't fall all over everything. So this goes in here, just like so. It'd be nice if they'd have made this so that you could have uh, taken the nipple out from the rear of the receiver without taking the barrel off, but they didn't. So we're not going to worry about that right now. I'm just going to give that a little snug with a wrench, a little snuggy snug. Sticky snug on your nipple. Oh, there we go. Hopefully I didn't make too many weird faces. <laughs> and this piece is actually, I guess you'd call it your receiver. As you can see it's, um, it's oil quenched. 
so this gives you these nice swirled marbled looks to them instead of being blued adds to the vintage look of the gun even though it's it's not really vintage so we're going to take uh and making sure our mainspring is sitting down on a trigger group you can see this you may not be able to see these are all slotted so it goes together pretty tight this dovetails right on you gotta make sure the spring is not in the way and it slides right on just like that and it's just sitting there it goes right in there and sets then you take your barrel and your barrel goes right inside the watch you can see it just like that just like that and then this one big allen bolt goes in here to hold it all together I'm gonna give that just a little bit of a tweak there and then I'm gonna put it here on my knee and get it in good shape so we've got that fairly tight you don't want to get it too tight and we're gonna take this and put it upside down for a minute I'm going to take a hand guard and slide it on there like that and push it down. And this one little quarter inch screw drops in there. Yeah. And then we just take this and stick it down in this access hole and we tighten it up. It's not very long. It's not a very big screw, so it doesn't have to be gorilla tight. This I might add every now and then could use a good bending, that little spring because what that does is that holds tension on your poker on your ramrod keeps it from falling out when you're walking around in the woods and there you have a fully assembled Thompson Center Scout actually this model is a Texas Scout is it uh, easy to take apart I think so it's not too bad it's not it's not prohibitive to stop me from getting one it's just a clicky gun I like it it's different it's got its quirks it's not like everybody else's and I guess that's why I like it but uh, anyway there you have it there's your video of how to tear apart and how to reassemble a Thompson Center Scout rifle pistols being I would assume the same way because they're made off the same receiver it's the same exact gun with a shorter barrel a different stock so I would assume that would be the same, though I've never had one apart. I'd like to thank our viewers, our subscribers, for giving me the hot tip, and telling me I should do this video about the Thompson Center Scout. I do love the gun. That's one of the reasons I included it in the first video. When I say first video, that's because we've got a few more black powder videos, and we're going to put links to those down in the description. Check out our other muzzle loader videos, black powder videos. Check out all of our videos. Hunt season's right around the corner. Nobody's wearing orange yet, but it's getting close. They're shopping in their knives and they're sighting in their rifles. I suggest you do the same.